This is the IEEE Computer Society Distinguished Lecturer Webinar Series brought to you by the Distinguished Visitors Program. The Distinguished Visitors Program delivers tools for individuals at all stages of their professional careers through visits to chapters, offering opportunities for individual interactions, and to the membership through webinars by respected professionals. We have distinguished visitors around the world who cover machine learning, cybersecurity, robotics, big data, cloud computing, blockchain, and cryptography, among others. Chapters can request a distinguished visitor on computer.org slash distinguished dash visitors. The Distinguished Visitors Program is able to pay up to $1,000 for a visit to a chapter, but by working with other nearby chapters to develop a tour, that amount can be increased. So when your chapter is planning its next event, think of the Distinguished Visitors Program. Welcome to our Distinguished Lecturer Webinar Series. My name is Kerry Cosby and I'm the Chapters Manager at the IEEE Computer Society and I oversee our more than 600 professional and student chapters around the world and manage our Distinguished Visitors Program. I'd like to take care of some housekeeping tasks before we go on. You can ask your questions in the Q&A panel. Dr. Misa will answer as many questions as he can following the presentation. When you're writing your questions, if it relates to a particular slide, please do your best to reference that slide. The webinar is being recorded and the recording will be made available after the webinar. Moore's Law represents a phenomenal growth in semiconductor electronics. The Computer Society has provided research revolving around semiconductor electronics for over 50 years. Currently, there are over 4,000 articles dedicated to this research in the Computer Society Digital Library. Additionally, we produce roadmaps for various technologies in the kit semiconductor industry published under the IEEE International uh, Roadmap for Devices and Systems, IRDS. IRDS. Furthermore, connect with other professionals within this field in the task force on rebooting computing technical community. More information will be shared after the webinar. You can also learn more at computer.org. In today's webinar, Dr. Thomas Misa will discuss Moore's Law 1965 to 2016. The beginning date of Moore's Law that guided phenomenal uh, growth in semiconductor electronics is well known to IEEE members, many of whom have detailed and, uh, and personal experiences with it over the years. This talk will gives an informed historian's perspective on Moore's Law based on a three-year research project at the Charles Babbage Institute and the author's forthcoming Leonardo uh, to the Internet um, from Johns Hopkins University Press, third edition. The presentation is brought to you as a partnership between the Distinguished Visitors Program and the IEEE Computer Society History Committee. I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Thomas J. Misa was ERA land grant professor of the of history of technology at the University of Minnesota, directing the Charles Babbage Institute, and is present is past president of the Society for the History of Technology from 2021 to 2022. His books include Communities of Computing, Computer Science and Society in the ACM published in 2017, and Gender Codes, Why Women Are Leaving the Leaving Computing, published in 2010. Dr. Misa, I'd like to pass the floor to you. Okay, thanks, Carrie. Um, Moore's Law uh, started in 1965, a date that many of you are familiar with, I'll make a case that it ended in 2016 for reasons that I hope to make clear. So my plan for today goes in five different pieces. First, I'll give kind of an overview of Moore's Law. Many of you know Moore's Law well, but just in case anybody is certain about this, I'll also try to define Moore's Law carefully. Moore's Law sometimes expands to cover almost everything, and I think it's useful to have a more focused, um, uh, more focused definition. Moore's Law is a good example of an instance where technology seems to drive history, but the core of the talk really is, well, what shapes the technologies that drive history? The core of the talk talks about three different changes, 
that's B1, B2, and B3. First, I'll look at changes in the U.S. semiconductor or chip industry. This is the 60s, 70s, and 80s. I'll also look at changes in the federal government. There were three policy shifts absent the changes in the chip industry and absent the policy shifts. I think that's very unlikely that Moore's law would have had the length and reach and power uh, that it had. And Kerry mentioned the IEEE's efforts in road mapping, and this talk actually explains a bit of where road mapping came from. So what shapes technology, changes in the industry, policy shifts, and the rise of road mapping? That's really the core of the talk. I'll give a case for you to consider that Moore's Law ended in 2016, and that is the end of the international technology roadmap for semiconductors. And then there's some conclusions. First, though, I'm highly mindful that many of you know Moore's Law from the inside out. I come to this as a historian. I've studied Moore's Law, read a lot of documents, talked with a lot of people, but it's very likely that many people in the audience will know, at least in bits and pieces, far, far, far more than I ever can. And in the Q&A, I'd be happy for your comments to see what I may have gotten right or what I may need to correct. So the little metaphor I'd like to have here is that each of these four coastlines, I can't tell you anything that you don't already know about them. If they're familiar, you know exactly what this is. But it might be the case by considering the four coastlines, rearranging them a little bit, and looking at the whole, we can learn something different. So I'll just sort of shift this around, move the coastlines so that they're appropriate east to west and north to south. And it may be the case that if we're lucky, yes, we get Australia. Now, I looked at this map on, of Australia, and there's this funny little piece that looks up at the north, looks like almost there's India there. But no, this is Australia and those four coastlines, north, south, east, and west. Many of you will know the coastlines intimately. You will know far more than I do. But maybe by considering how the pieces fit together, again, we can learn something about the whole of Moore's Law, 1965 to 2000. 16. So to start out, just a couple of views, kind of rough views to sketch in. This is Gordon Moore. Uh, he was one of the leaders in the industry when this picture was taken in the early 60s, I think early 60s. He was the research director at Fairchild Semiconductor, a kind of second order spinoff from William Shockley's um, California uh, shop. And then as research director of Fairchild Semiconductor, Moore had access to all kinds of inside information and was considering the path of the industry as a whole. The graph here is a view of the number of components that can be most economically manufactured. So the relative manufacturing cost, that's the uh, y-axis, the number of components per integrated circuit. This is a log graph. You can see up at the top, 1962, it looks like the um, maximum number is around 12. 1965, maximum number might have been around 50. And more basically in 1965, made some prophecies about 1970 and even more boldly about 1975. Electronics Magazine asked him essentially to kind of look at the future. The experts look ahead, they said. And Moore's view was that cramming more components onto integrated circuits was one powerful means to shape the industry as a whole. And the transistor industry, many of you know, was highly uh, variegated. There were lots of different kinds of transistors, many different types, different ways of fabricating them. And so what Moore was doing was focusing on a, essentially a single type of monolithic integrated circuits built from silicon. Monolithic integrated circuits built from silicon. Not everybody agreed with that, but that was that was at least the core that um, that Gordon Moore prophesied really in 1965. And that led to the remarkable shift on the left side, the relatively simple chip prior to 
you know, dual inline packaging. I think that's 1961. That was one of the early, I think it's a flip-flop that um, Fairchild did. And on the right side is a Pentium chip from about the year 2000. I'll just give you a picture of Moore holding not a chip, but of course the whole wafer. Gordon Moore is still alive and he's had quite a life and seen quite a lot of um, change in this industry. And a big part of that can be fairly described as Moore's Law. My emphasis is going to be on how many people beyond Gordon Moore and beyond 1965 really were needed to realize the speculative, the kind of forecast that Moore came up with in, in 1965. It's a cast literally of thousands and thousands and thousands. And that's my one, two, three, B1, two, and three points that I'll, I'll make. So Moore plotted his results. And you can see on the bottom, 1959, then he's got a couple of more data points. And then the dashed lines are really his prophecy, his guess, his intuition from looking at the industry from a very well-informed technical point. This was not more, I believe, but this was a redrawing that Intel did. Those of you that are mathematically minded will notice that there's something very odd about this graph. A hint is you can still see what's odd about this graph, even with this, uh, with this overlay. So this provides a kind of table for the change in microprocessors, not the original DRAMs, but the more complex logic-based chips, the microprocessors that Intel and, and others uh, made. This, I think, is an interesting graph. It shows you the number of transistors from the year of introduction, 1971, through 2004. And if you plot that graph, it doesn't look perfectly like a straight line. And Moore and Bob Noyce and other people, Carver Mead, oftentimes sort of adjusted which technologies and which particular chips they would use to draw a straight line graph that would have more power. Another just interesting comment here is that this is very Intel-centered, and Moore's Law, I think, fairly radiated outward from Intel. So this is an Intel microprocessor, an Intel 286, an Intel, Intel, Intel. I've heard it told that Intel basically set up Moore's Law in part as an industry coordinating mechanism, but also in part as a means for its own competitive strategy so that they reason this way. Everybody is focusing on meeting Moore's Law, some number of chips at some year, but Intel thought that it could beat Moore's Law. So if, if everybody was focusing on merely achieving Moore's Law, um, Intel could beat their competitors uh, in the marketplace. So that's at least a suggestion that this was partly industry-wide coordination, but partly smart business and smart technology strategy uh, for Intel itself. And we'll, stepping back just a little bit and looking at kind of the wider media history or public history. And I did a little graph from Google's Ngram. That's basically books. I've also done a plot that looks at ProQuest, which is basically a magazine and periodical journal literature. You get the same shape. So that prior to, you know, 1975, there are no measures whatsoever. Prior to 18, 1985, there's only a few measures. It's really in the 1990s that Moore's Law takes off. 1990s is also, by the way, when globalization takes off. So there's changes in the wider environment that paved the way, provided background for the internationalization of, um, of Moore's Law. Now, Moore's Law, it's not like it ends here, but there's some funny things uh, going on around the year 2004. And I'll explain why 2004 is particularly uh, notable and, um, and, and and consequential. It's also interesting to me, not only there's a relative drop in the frequency that Moore's Law is being uh, referenced, but there's also a kind of difference between Moore's Law capitalized in red, much more popular than Moore's Law not capitalized in green, the way that Google plots this. So Moore's Law is a serious law. It's a capitalized law. It's not some sort of loose law 
it's something that's very strong and trying to understand its strength and its power and its duration is one of the things I'd like to do in this talk. This, at least, this is from The Economist, and it suggests Moore's Law is stuttering a bit. If you look at the blue, it sure looks like the transistors per chip just continue to grow again at a log or exponential-based rate. But if you look at clock speeds, then very clearly there's a kind of flattening. Intel, with its Pentium chip, hoped to hit 10 gigahertz. Never did. So you can see the speed is flattening. Crucial part is that the amount of heat that the individual chips beyond a certain density threw up also led to a kind of plateau that's in that lowermost, it's kind of brownish gray. In the upper left, you can see transistors bought per dollar on a steep climb, but that also has plateaued. So there's some kind of a shift in the industry as a whole and in the technological trajectory of semiconductor electronics. And I'll try to focus in on that a little bit and then to justify my suggestion that Moore's Law ended in 2016. So the first of the big changes is a change in the industry itself. And this picture is from the mid-1960s, and this is the Traitorous Eight, so-called Traitorous Eight. This, this is the people that spun off from Shockley and organized Fairchild Semiconductor. Bob Noyce, the kind of charismatic, extroverted, wild, uh, energetic man, is at the center there. And I, I've given the names uh, clockwise from Noyce. These are all quite famous names. Gordon Moore is on the right side of the picture, I think the third one in. And then next to him is actually Eugene Kleiner. That's the Eugene Kleiner of Kleiner Perkins, one of the early successful, fabulously successful Silicon Valley um, venture capital companies. So there's an important connection forward into how uh, the industry and much beyond ends up getting funded. And at least Eugene Kleiner is at the center of that. So the transformation goes like this. These men, I think, were kind of cocky. They were confident. 
Hello, Carrie or Scott, are you there? Yeah, we're here. I, I think you uh, dropped off, and but we this can is, still hear you. Just, it's very exciting. We lose power every once in a while. We had a complete power outage. So I'm on my cell phone. I've got perfectly fine coverage there, but we'll need to do the backup, which is you advance the slides and I give the talk, okay? That's perfectly I'm fine. Gonna... Um, what Can you remind me what slide you were on? Because mine is, we were on the, the image of, the, of uh, the gentleman at the table, yes? Exactly, yeah. Moore's Law Transformation, uh, the industry itself. Okay, go right ahead and tell me when to change. So that would be slide nine, Carrie. So the first thing that it'll do is it will back off and then I'll go through the bullet points. So I can I can continue. Just tell me when I should start. Okay, so I'm changing you to the next slide, which is uh, the bullet points are now coming up. And the uh, bullet point. Yeah, bullet point one is up. Great. So just continuing there, um, sorry, our power here uh, on an island in Northwest Washington just went out, doesn't do this often. Somebody should hire some electrical engineers to keep this, keep this going. Semiconductor industry in the 1960s was very different from what it became. And this uh, little quote from Charles, Charles Sport, uh, he was uh, executive at Fairchild and then also uh, worked as uh, the leader of National said he remembered the semiconductor industry in the 1960s as being tremendously competitive. It was a knock them down, fight them, kill them type of environment. Next bullet point, please. Nicholas DeWolf of Paradigm said we buried competitors bang, bang on a regular basis. Michael McNeely of Applied Materials, next point, said we were always somewhat cantankerous. These were companies that competed with one another in very active ways. This was kind of cutthroat capitalism and the people around this table, but around the industry as a whole, kind of relished uh, that, that kind of cutthroat competition. Moore's Law was not imaginable, I think, in, uh, in that kind of competitive competition. So next slide. The merchant companies of that emerged, that TI, Intel is formed in 1968, National Semiconductor, Motorola, AMD, and also there were two large in-house manufacturers. That was IBM for its own computing systems and AT&T for its uh, military electronics as well as for the phone system. And this situation, seemingly led to a certain kind of success. Next bullet point, the U.S. companies had something of 95% of the U.S. market until the Japanese and their very active transistor and semiconductor industry started making headway with both 64K and 256K DRAM. That's, that's the dynamic random access memory. So next slide. The talk so far has been focusing about men, men, and men. And this picture has, the again, the same trader as eight. The leadership at Fairchild all focused on uh, looking at Bob Noyes. But the next animation will indicate green circles around all the women that were in this factory. So men may have been the leaders, but there were a whole lot of women that worked as the technicians to actually get the chips to be fabricated, to be clean, to be effective, and uh, then uh, to be tested. Next slide, number 11, please. Going back to the transformations of the industry. The we're on there. Go ahead. Point, the first point in the transformations of the industry was really the rise of a couple of different cooperative mechanisms. And the first of the, these, and it's 
DSIA, Semiconductor Industry Association, was formed in 1977. Five of the leaders, including uh, people from all of the big companies, basically formed an industry association as a platform so that people from different companies wouldn't be doing bang-bang competition, but they would be connected and have a means for talking with one another. Another important cooperative mechanism was the founding a couple of years later of the Semiconductor Research Corporation that funded a lot of academic research based on uh, money that the industry uh, collected itself. This was a major shift from the kind of hyper-competitive um, cut them, kill them, et cetera, et cetera, that it had existed in the 1960s. Next bullet point is Charles Spork's comment. Suddenly, with the well, actually, the U.S. firms end up losing their dominant role, shrink to about 10% of the DRAM market. And that's when Charles Spork, his quote is, suddenly, Japan is the threat. Suddenly, we started talking to each other. How do we meet this threat? And that led to the formation of Semitech. That happened in two different um, ways. That's the next animation. MCC was an early version of that. Moore had something to do with suggesting to Control Data's Bill Norris to create a kind of pool. He said, get everybody in this room together. We can work this out. That was in 1982. And then in 1987, Semitech was formed, and that was a much wider and deeper uh, research development they ran a fab in Austin, Texas. It was a much wider um, effort, again, at cooperative mechanisms across the industry. SIA itself ended up not only providing a place for people to talk, but also a place where the industry leaders could speak with one voice, not the individual companies, but the Semiconductor Industry Association would lobby Congress. They would lobby the executive branch that's not the president so much, but that's where all the agencies are, the Department of Justice, the Department of Congress, the Department of Defense. All of those are important, and that's the pointer, the C2, that is going to my second point about the transformation of the government as a whole. The next animation opens up and defines Moore's Law. Moore's Law is defined in many different expansive ways, but I think it's real power what made it a strong force that guided the semiconductor industry in the United States and eventually worldwide was a kind of focus on doing one thing. What you did, according to Moore's Law, all you needed to do, and many of you know that shrinking the lithography dimensions is no easy task, but if you did that, not only were chips smaller, they became faster. There was less distance for electrons to move. And if you did the economics and the engineering correctly, they became cheaper. And this is sort of interesting, too. In the 60s, there were all kinds of different chips. There were molecular electronics that was popular for a while. For a time, people were keen on gallium arsenide chips. Uh, IBM for 10 years, what, 1973 to 1983, was pushing Josephson junction transistors. They're still around, but that was at least IBM's idea about that was the next step. Gordon Moore said, no, the standard metal oxide silicon, MOS or MOSFET or FinFET uh, transistors today is all the technology you need. You don't need to do fancy superconducting. You don't need to do obscure or uh, innovative gallium arsenide standard MOS chip. If you did everything correct, you would have a doubling in elements and sometimes a doubling in speed every, and then I'm going to waffle on this because Moore sometimes said 12 months, and then sometimes he said 24 months, and it seemed like it settled down about every 18 months or so. So this is a kind of a slider that was not a law of nature, but it's a sort of a outcome of a bunch of different investments that the industry uh, was uh, was making. And Moore's Law provided guidance about what investments to make. So Moore's Law, 
is powerful because it said, don't worry about rival, strange, exotic architectures or exotic materials. Focus on silicon chips. Make them smaller. That's very powerful. It provides a way for the industry to be um, meeting a whole host of very complex R&D goals with a, or R&D steps with a single goal in mind. So we can shift to slide 12, please. The SIA lobbying the U.S. Congress and Executive Bureau was no accident. And absent the changes in the industry, the formation at SIA as a well-organized, speaking with one voice, lobbying organization, none of the changes in the government could ever e easily be brought out. But I'll point to three. And these were sometimes a little unusual. First was relaxing antitrust. It's well known that IBM and AT&T ever since the 50s were involved with lawsuits. I think it hampered IBM. It sort of tripped up AT&T in terms of how AT&T dealt with the um, civilian uh, computer market. But in 1984, the U.S. government passed the National Cooperative Research Act, and that made it A-OK -okay not to do price fixing, but to do cooperative um, mechanisms within an industry to do research and then, of course, then to be uh, thinking about the future. But to do that cooperatively without the threat of antitrust. Second uh, animation says, this was highly unusual, the U.S. government acting through the Commerce Department, with the full agreement of the was the Reagan administration at the time protected the, the U.S. industry. Um, in 1986, the Defense Science Board published what was then a kind of worrisome report on semiconductor dependency. That is, it appeared that the U.S. industry and the U.S. military was becoming dependent on the, uh, how to say, foreign competitors. We have some of those the same thoughts uh, floating around our discussions today. So in 1986, the U.S. government took steps to restrict trade with Japan, and the Japanese weren't moving quickly enough, so Ronald Reagan slapped 100% tariffs on Japanese TVs, certain kinds of Japanese computers, and then also, I think, on Japanese power tools. So this is a very strong thing. Normally, the U.S. government supports industry. It encourages, it gives big contracts, it picks winners sometimes. But normally, the U.S. government has not been involved with trade wars or with the kind of very focused trade restrictions that the SIA had been lobbying for and that the U.S. government delivered. That's number two. Number three is Semitech itself. We can move to the uh, next reveal. The direct subsidy to Semitech came through the Defense Department, through DARPA, about $100 million a year. So in the first five years, 1987 to 1992, that accounted for about a half a billion dollars. The industry itself kicked in an equivalent amount. So during that first five years, Semitech was pretty amply funded um, with a whole of about uh, a billion dollars. That paid for, uh, they got a fabulous uh, brand new semiconductor fabrication or fab in Austin, Texas, the University of Texas and the Texas uh, Congressional Legislature uh, moved some uh, mountains there. And then road mapping was also begun uh, during that time. Road mapping was rather inexpensive, very complicated, but something like about a million dollars a year is what I'd say. The last one there just says none of this would have been likely in the bang, bang, bury the competitors' years uh, from the 1960s. So organizing the industry, forming a voice, then getting the U.S. federal government to line up these three important policy shifts, those are crucial, maybe not the whole story, but absolutely crucial to being able to organize R&D cooperatively, to meet together in the SIA and in Semitech, and then pretty soon to extend that into national and international 
road mapping. So slide number 13, please. This is the third of the major transformations, which is the rise of road mapping. Road mapping itself sometimes is understood as simply being making forecasts, the 10 year forecast or as the industry practiced a 15 year forecast, but it's not merely that. Road mapping is a much more detailed and exhausting and exhaustive uh, process. Next bullet. Road mapping entails a determined, detailed path to get there. You need a logical and systematic approach to defining the needs for supporting technologies for materials and other resources. One example of that next bullet is that somebody said for one change in device size, going from one of the Moore's Law instances to the next one, for one device size change, it needs an exposure tool. Uh, six different companies have to uh, co cooperate. A resist technology, three companies for that. And then the mask technology involved another two or three industries. These were all things that maybe the biggest firms, maybe IBM, maybe AT&T, could have taken a part of itself, themselves. But the industry as a whole, even though Intel was growing like crazy and became a really big firm, they were basically medium-sized firms. So Moore's Law then was a mechanism for the firms to be able to cooperate on making roadmaps. So next bullet. Moore's Law then leads to a pattern of organized innovation. The last bullet of that slide is a quote from Gordon Moore himself. He said, uh, these roadmaps are a question of putting the track ahead of the train to stay on the, in this instance, it was the SIA plan. So it's a little bit, you can see it's a bit of bootstrapping and uh, trying to launch uh, into the future. Slide 14, please. Gordon Moore actually had quite a lot to do. This is the SIA roadmap of 1992. And you can see across the top, it's stretching out to 2007. And there's a lot of information here. I won't go through it. Some of you actually know and may even have participated in this. But across the top, you can see that the feature size in microns is shrinking dramatically. Also in that same box, the gate per chip and number of millions is increasing dramatically. And then at the bottom, there's an important side story. It's not a side story at all, but the role of the um, shrinking voltages is, uh, is very important. The final reveal or animation focuses on one weakness, I think, of this under maximum power, the red box there indicates that in 2004, the performance would be something like between 40 and 120 watts per die, and then increasing all the way up to 200 watts per die. And so a 200 watt transistor got hot, and that's what led to this problem of thermal death that AMD and Intel both experienced. So it's like taking a big, big, big incandescent light bulb, you know, those old-fashioned hot ones, and shrinking it to the size of your thumbnail and maybe even to your uh, little fingernail. There's just too much heat that, uh, that those uh, chips are, are generating. So let's do a little bit of a chronology about road mapping. That slide 15, please. The road mapping itself came characteristically from within the SIA in 1984. And the story apparently was that there were four or five or six different companies. Engineers were sitting around at the end of the day, maybe it was a Friday, thinking about like, where is all of this going? And they said, well, we could do targets. We can kind of see where the industry is going. So they did 10 year targets for lithography dimensions, for voltages, for the feature size of the integrated chips etc. And like the etc. because it's, of course, more than simply this. The first bullet is that the Department of Defense 
played an important role. They had, remember, that was the very high-speed integrated circuit. That was a way of looking at micron and sub-micron uh, scale integrated circuits, very high speed for military use. And that involved a lot of theorizing about building roadmaps. So there was a set of documents that were passed as a guide in Semitex planning to develop a standard model of the theory of road mapping. So the Defense Department played an important role at kind of theorizing and structuring and giving some bite. Individual companies had their own roadmap or something that looked like a roadmap, but they needed a common language so that the SIA as a whole could all talk about more or less the same thing. Next bullet, please. Gordon Moore, I mentioned, chaired the committee that led to the 1992 roadmap. I think that's the first one with 15 years looking forward into the future a full uh, 15 years. And there I'm just listing the different types of dimensions that the SIA Semotech 1992 roadmap in, involved. Lithography, manufacturing systems, thermal processes, automation, packaging, testing, cleaning, process architecture. This is not simply shrinking dimensions, but it's a real system where all the pieces have to fit to uh, fit together. Next bullet, the first national technology roadmap for semiconductors came two years later in 1994, and that made, quote, a central assumption that Moore's Law, defined as a four times increase in complexity every three years, so that's doubling roughly every 18 months, that was one of the sort of middle points of that slider, would extend again to the next 15 years across that period of time, again, providing a set of targets for not merely feature size, but all the other pieces of a complex manufacturing uh, system that needed to, to be put together. So uh, slide 16, please, is the end of Moore's Law. And I'll just put that as a somewhat of a question mark. But I think that there's a case to be made that 2016 is the important point to focus on. So here I'm stressing that Moore's law is not a law of nature. It's not F equals MA. It's not E equals MC squared. They shifted what the domains of this law were quite creatively. They shifted, you'd say, the ex exponents, you know, 12 months, 18 months, or 24 months. They sometimes said it was a, about one technology charge couple devices early on were written up. Bob Noyce said all sorts of great things about charge coupled devices being the wave of the future for semiconductor electronics. I was planning on building CPUs, I guess, with um, with charge coupled devices. That didn't quite work out and so charge coupled devices were moved off the moved off the the stage. This is not a law of nature, but actually I think an active achievement. It's a real feat, really, and it's an technical feat and an organizational feat, ultimately a, a political feat. And the list of people involved would be, and I don't mean just Intel, it's not just Gordon Moore and Bob Noyce, the Caltech professor, um, Carver Mead was drafted to the cause, lots and lots and lots of people all started looking and essentially pounced on and propounded and entrenched the idea of these long-term trajectories uh, in the industry. The industry itself, not least through the SIA, ended up taking some lead, but then also using that as a way of rallying the troops, uh, speaking with one voice, where is the technology going? The best answer was not, not gallium arsenide or Josephson junctions. The best answer was we know where the technology is going. So at least to the federal government, the industry knew exactly uh, what it was about and uh, where it was going. The federal government, remember, made three important policy changes, essentially loosening antitrust, engaging in tough trade restrictions, and then directly funding Semitech. Again, absent those earlier changes in the industry, hard to imagine that the federal government would have responded to um, you know, six or eight or ten individual companies 
um, all speaking with uh, disparate and conflicting voices. Again, Semitech leading to the National Technology Roadmap for Semiconductors and an International Technology Roadmap in 1999. The reveal there, please, can you just move to the little pie chart that, that moves forward? This is in 2005, by the way. And in 2005, this is an interesting time because you can see that the U.S. is 55% of ITRS, and China would soon be uh, joining in 2006, I believe. They joined the World Semiconductor Council in 2006, and then they too, chi the Chinese industry was brought into the ITRS. So next bullet, why the need for a global industry? There were two things, I think, going on. One was technological. That is, in an era when optics and precision optics and the march toward shorter and shorter wavelengths, the American firms were not as good in that as the Japanese firms Canon and Nikon. And one of the engineers said, well, we needed to get Canon and Nikon to be involved with this process, to be looking out 10 or 15 years. There was no mechanism for them to do so, but through the International Technology Roadmap for Semiconductors, through the Japanese Semiconductor Industry Association. There was a means then of speaking cooperatively and collaboratively with um, uh, researchers and engineers at Canon and, and Nikon. Another point, the next bullet, is the tremendous increase in capitalization, so-called rock law. That's from Arthur Roth. He did a lot of financing, and he wasn't worried about chips getting smaller. He was worried about the cost of fabs, the semiconductor uh, fabrication, getting increasingly expensive. And he came up with a kind of tongue-in-cheek law that this was doubling every two to four years. And so they were $100 billion for a while. That was expensive. Then they were a billion that was expensive, then they were 10 billion, and I think that the latest ones now cost something like 20 billion dollars. So there's a tremendous technological risk and a tremendous financial risk. Now, all of those considerations are a suggestion that ITRS was necessary. I think I will just say necessary to the internationalization, the globalization of Moore's Law, having some place just like SIA was for the U.S. industry, having some place where the semiconductor industries and companies um, could meet and discuss the technological future and R&D uh, targets was absolutely vital. Next bullet is a suggestion that something is changing, and there's several different points that the industry itself is changing. The first one is the thermal law I've mentioned in 2004. Both uh, AMD and Intel hit that. Instead of with Intel, it's Pentium chips getting smaller and smaller and faster and faster. They got smaller and smaller and hotter and hotter. And in 2004, the Pentium chips basically ended up getting so hot that they didn't work. There were all kinds of just technical problems uh, with that. Intel said this was a hard toggle to our product line. And revealingly, another place, Intel said, we are revamping our roadmap. Now, that wasn't the international roadmap. That was Intel's own internal roadmap. But they knew that, th that something big was going on. IBM said that classical scaling is dead. It's a time when you could just predict from Moore's Law scaling where the industry was going that had ended. So increasingly, you can see this with the ITRS. It's not so much focused only on speed or smaller devices, but also on effective mobile electronics, focus on instant-on technologies, and then focus on uh, technologies that are able with small power requirements to power the Internet of Things. All of this is way, way, way more complicated than that single, powerful, do one thing that I think is the uh, essence and core of Moore's Law. 
next bullet point there is the rise of application-specific integrated circuits. The ITRS tried to incorporate this, but instead of being a standard good, like a DRAM or even a CPU, application-specific integrated circuits do many, 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 many different things. So it's not quite clear what the correct measurements are for measuring progress or looking at the next uh, uh, the next round of forecasts for that. Um, the efforts by, among others, Morris Chang at the TSMC basically uh, created an entirely different foundry model where the foundry firms like TSMC and two others about the same size and a host of smaller ones focus not on design alone, but basically on manufacturing. They are foundries in the same way that other companies became foundries for iron or steel or something else. And those foundry companies have become a major force in the industry, again, completely complicating the simple, more or less straightforward achievement of Moore's Law. Final bullet from slide 16 is that ITRS was wound up. It seemed like it had extended and had done useful work, and it's just going in too many directions. So ITRS is ended in 2016. You'll also remember in that same year, 2016, the politics changed. Prior to that point in time, tech firms were routinely lionized. And it was Bill Gates for a while, and it was Andy Grove. Andy Grove was Time Magazine's Man of the Year. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg, who's been taking it on the chin this past week, he too was lionized for bringing Facebook uh, to the masses. But our politics has, has changed. And in the U.S. and U.K., you know, nationalist governments, strangely anti-globalist uh, governments, were brought to power in 2016. And since then, in many countries, not only in the U.S., also interestingly in China, there's the rise of really what's anti-technological skepticism. How this will play out is a political question, but it just suggests that the simple, straightforward, disciplined march to smaller dimensions of Moore's Law, that ended. I propose 2016. So let's move to slide 17. My conclusions there are four. Moore's Law being one thing, shrinking chips. Now, Many people in the audience will know there's a whole lot of very interesting work. Computer architecture, all of a sudden, is a very important topic. The reform of the U.S. industry in the 60s and 70s paved the way to government support that possibly saved the U.S. industry. It certainly set up SIA and the context for road mapping. I stress the need with international road mapping for global R&D to connect people around the world with the companies at the time that were leading optics, that is Canon and Nikon. And I think it's not too strong to say that Moore's Law itself simply depended on the International Technology Roadmap for Semiconductors, at least 1999 through its windup in 2016. The next bullet makes an important connection, and I very much enjoy having some time during the Q&A to discuss this, because IEEE as a whole picked up, and Carrie mentioned IRDS, a focus on devices and systems. And there was a specific handoff that IRDS was seen as a successor to the International Technology Roadmap for semiconductors. I've looked at the R&D consortium, and I have some puzzles about this. Intel is there. Um, Sandia is there. Fiat is there. Dartmouth College is there. But some of the biggest heavyweights in the industry today, I cannot find them. So TSMC is not there. Samsung, the huge uh, Korean uh, manufacturer, is not there. And then the Dutch firm, ASML, that brings the world's um, uh, state-of-the-art 
chip making machines, these are the machines working now just at the edge of X-ray. They call it extreme ultraviolet, but it's right at the edge of where X-rays begin. Very, 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 very short wave electricity or wavelength. And those three firms, at least, I can't find them there. Another thing I'd be interested in learning more about is the Computer Society's rebooting computing initiative. Peter Denning, I think, launched this in 2012 kind of as a way of thinking in a kind of open-ended way about the future of computing. My understanding is that there is now a specific relationship between the computer society's rebooting computing and the IEEE's IRDS. I can't quite understand that, but I appreciate uh, learning some more about that. Then my fifth point, again, is maybe we're back to a new Semitech. Some of the same concerns about semiconductor dependency and the Defense Department's concern about chip supplies, uh, that was put in in the uh, so-called CHIPS Act. There's also something called the FABS Act that's uh, floating around. The CHIPS Act was um, passed through the first part of the U.S. Congress in January of 2021. That is, it was authorized but nobody has yet appropriated money. So authorization is kind of like the promise of a check, but appropriation means you actually get to have money, and that, as my understanding goes, hasn't yet happened. So maybe we'll have the CHIPS Act in 2022, and that looks to me a lot like um, how Semitech works. So for further reading, we'll go to slide 18. There's several different places that, that you can look for. Uh, there's a really fine biography by Arnold Thackeray and David Brock and a uh, London journalist on Moore's Law. This says everything about Gordon Moore that you possibly would want to know. They've interviewed everybody. It's very dense and very detailed. And if you want the inside story of Gordon Moore's life, there is a splendid biography exactly to that point. I've provided in my last chapter for the third edition to of Leonardo to the Internet, a kind of full accounting of Moore's Law from which this uh, talk today is abstracted. And I also deal there with the kind of contest between the promise of the democratic Internet and the reality in several countries of a more authoritarian, top-down uh, authoritarian uh, Internet. And then finally, um, if you're nervous or unhappy about my declaration of Moore's Law ending in 2016. You can look at this week's uh, MIT Technology Review. They do a fabulous piece um, that says, inside the machine, this is ASML, that saved Moore's Law. And they are unreconstructed believers in Moore's Law. So if you want a little counterpoint to my view, then that's the place to go. So that's, that's my talk. Uh, I hope that you were able to follow the slides. Uh, apologies for our technology breakdown here. And Carrie, you can please help organize our um, Q&A session. Thank you. All right, yeah, thank you. It was a great presentation. I have a question for you before we move into Q&A so that some questions can come in. Uh, my question is, now that you've given this, do I not have to buy another version of the uh, Leonardo to the Internet to get this new yes, uh, chapter? Yes. Uh, well, <laughs> it's, it's funny, Carrie. There have been dozens and dozens and dozens of scholars who've written pieces of the Moore's Law saga. And I hope I'm not tooting my own horn, but I know of no one no other historical account that puts together the saga from 1965 all the way through uh, 2004. Some people think Moore's Law ended then, but I think Moore's Law ended in 2016. So you must get the third edition story. That's the only place where that whole history is, uh, is worked out. Well, I probably would anyway, because most one of the things that I really liked about your book was that it gave both the the social processes that were going on at the time of all of the changes of the the uh, 
uh, mechanisms that you've talked about and and the uh, the political processes that are changing. So I'm sure that'll be in there, which we didn't get quite as much of that in this conversation, I'm sure. Yeah. Moore's Law is an amazing, complex story. And I think it's to the disservice of our understanding about how technology actually progresses to think that it was simple, that Gordon Moore somehow prophesied the future, that he saw everything in 1965. I've given you ample grounds to think, well, yes, it was partly Intel and partly the industry and partly SIA and partly the supportive actions of the federal government road mapping on and on and on and on and on. That's what really gave Moore's Law not its initial bite, but its tremendous strength and breadth and tremendous duration as well. That's really remarkable. And I think that's a story that needs to be widely understood so that we don't think that technology just comes from, you know, the pen or the mouthpiece of a prominent figure. There's a tremendous amount of work behind the scenes that Moore did, that people at Intel did, that the whole industry did. And so that is something that we can understand, and I think it makes the, the saga of Moore's Law even a way more impressive. All right, great. We've got some good co uh, questions that have come in. Let's go for the first one here. What are your thoughts on quantum computing and Moore's Law? Oh, I'm uncertain about quantum computing. Sorry. <laughs> no, no other answer. No other answer to that. I think quantum computing is like Josephson's junction. And it may well be the case that there is a tremendous leap forward. But what Moore's law during its years of real bite and real power, it said focus on one thing, one deceptively simple thing. And so superconducting Josephson junctions, transistors, or the work in quantum computing, all of that will be complex. There won't be a single point where the entire industry can somehow organize. And maybe there will be a new Moore's Law, but I don't think that quantum computing will be simple, at least from what I've read. And it will be a highly um, complicated technology, and, and there's fabulous work going on. I don't think that's a continuation at all of Moore's Law. It's a highly complex new technology that um, may well be tremendously promising. It breaks code. That's the, that's the key thing, right? The code, um, the encryption that e-commerce depends on right now depends on computers being slow enough that, you know, you can't break the RSA code. And it's pretty clear that quantum computers can simply do factorization so quickly that the type of encryption that e-commerce depends on and much else um, is at severe risk. So that would be certainly a disruptive technology in several different dimensions. All right, great. Uh, the next question is, what do you think about current Intel efforts to A, enter the foundry business and B, gain more government support to break dependency on TSMC, et cetera? Basically, I think Intel is scrambling, to, to be perfectly honest. Intel was the biggest semiconductor company for a long time. TSMC pushed them aside. TSMC does the foundry model, and that seemingly is where a big swath of the industry is going. Look, AMD basically sold off its its foundry, that, or sold off its, um, its manufacturing equipment to form global uh, foundries, and that's about one-eighth the size of, um, of TSMC. So I think Intel made a big bet that they were going to remain an integrated firm. So they would be designing chips, engineering chips, making chips, assembling chips, and then sending chips out the front door. They have had their biggest uh, facility Many of you know is in Hillsboro, Oregon, just outside of Portland. They have four huge, huge, huge factories there. And what I read a couple of years ago looked pretty clear that Intel was moving its latest generation of factories to Arizona. 
uh, Chandler, Arizona, maybe other other places as well. But they were more or less resisting the idea of doing a foundry model which separates the design and engineering from the actual manufacturing. Um, many people think that's a mistake, and Intel has just taken a beating in the stock market. AMD and and other uh, companies, NVIDIA, are nipping at Intel's heels. So the only thing you can say is it remains to be said, Intel has done a whole lot of smart things over the years and maybe some kind of hybrid model where you have foundries for certain kinds of goods and in-house facilities for other kinds of uh, other kinds of manufacturing is the way to go. Intel missed the Moore's Law. It's not widely reported, but they got seven nanometers and they have missed the five uh, nanometers that uh, TSMC handily achieved. TSMC is now aiming at three, by the way. It's like eight uranium atoms or something. Very, very, very small. So Intel is struggling. All right, great. The last one, um, I think, is not really a, a question, uh, but maybe giving us an, an idea for a future talk. This one says, this was a great talk. I would love to hear another talk on the evolution of process names and how they relate to the real feature sizes. Maybe that's something we can talk about uh, at some other time. What do you think? That sounds good. It's, re it's very uh, interesting to me because the sizing and the labels are apparently, they have a little bit of uncertainty about them. So I've heard it said, and I'm not sure I'd be happy to be corrected or to be modified, that the main companies are all trying to hit the seven nanometer or five nanometer um, device sizes, but they measure that in slightly different ways. So an Intel chip hitting seven nanometers is not precisely the same as a TSMC chip hitting that, that same benchmark. So I would be interested to know what level of agreement, because it seems like it's an inch is an inch. A meter is a meter. A nanometer should be a nanometer. But it depends on exactly what you're measuring with minimum device sizes, gate width, or there's lots of other uh, different ways of, uh, of measuring that. I think that'd be something I'd be interested in, in knowing more about before giving a talk on it. All right, and if we can take just one more uh, question. This last question is, do you see a successor to Moore's Law? A successor, no. I think it was singular. And the point is, Moore's Law said, focus on one technology. Focus on MOS transistors built into integrated circuits. Do one thing with that technology. Make the chips smaller and smaller. That will result in faster chips and cheaper chips, and that powered a big swath of the entire digital revolution. That truly is powerful. I think the landscape right now goes in so many different directions that even if there will be kind of mini Moore's Law for the individual pieces, there won't be an overarching Moore's Law. I think the environment for semiconductor technology is just too diverse. I mean, how do you measure an application-specific integrated circuit? Maybe it's doing networking, or maybe it's doing memory management, or maybe it's doing something else, but there's no single measurement. That's what Moore's Law had at its core, at least, in the way that I think it was very powerful. Do one thing. I don't think we'll get a law like that. At least I can't see anything like that. You know, your earlier one earlier question was about quantum computing. Totally different. Totally uh, fascinating to try to speculate on that, but I doubt that there will be an overarching Moore's Law with the same kind of bite and power and breadth and reach that Moore's Law had for three decades or more. All right. Um, well, I know that I could talk about this for at least another hour, but we probably had better um, shut it down now. We were a little over, over time. Um, I'd like to take this moment to thank Dr. Misa, and I'd like to thank all of you for attending. Dr. Misa's webinar kicks off our series of webinars on the history of computing.
which is a celebration of the 75th anniversary of the Computer Society and the 50th anniversary of the Distinguished Visitors Program. Our next webinar will be five historical lessons about gender in computing, and that'll be tomorrow uh, and at 1 o'clock p.m. U.S. Eastern Time. We'll have six more Distinguished Lecturer Webinar Series webinars between now and November 12th. I recommend you register now and join us for all of those. And in our Build Your Career webinar series, we'll be having one on persuasion, or sorry, persuasive conversations, why low impact words don't work by Elsa Velasco Paul, and that'll be on November 18th. Registration is now open for all of these, and we'll be sending you a link to these future events along with the recording of this webinar. Again, Dr. Misa, thank you very much for your presentation. It was great. We really enjoyed having it. Thank you. Please do it.